morning Park Ridge. So glad you're joining us this morning. We have a couple big announcements. One is that we have, we've had two great successes on our Tuesday night worship nights. So we're gonna have another one this Tuesday. Just drive up to the church. Um, it's been a great time of worship. And then also, you do not wanna be spacing out on this part. We are having a fir our first drive-in Sunday service this upcoming Sunday. This upcoming Sunday, June 7th, we're having a drive-in service right here at the church, so you do not want to miss that. Because we're doing a drive-in, we've never done this before, we need volunteers. So if you would like to volunteer to help us set up or, or um, direct traffic, um, help with parking, please contact the church, contact um, Pastor Brad or Nathan about how you can volunteer and help out with that. As always, down below we have links for the children's curriculum, for offerings, so don't forget to give and continue to make that a part of your Sunday experience. And also, if you're a guest, we're so glad that you've joined us this morning. Please fill out a contact form so we can let you know about what's going on in the future. We can um, send out material to you and just stay connected with you. So that's in the link down below. Now we're going to enter into a time of worship, and then Brad's going to bring us a message for Pentecost Sunday. church excited to be here with this morning and excited to bring God's word to you I trust that this word really ministers to our hearts and lives this morning we can grow through it we've been going through the series what is church really and Nathan introduced the definition of church in the first week as the expression of the kingdom of heaven on earth 
part of that expression is being, doing, experiencing, embracing what Jesus said we would be, do, experience, and embrace. And, and one of those aspects is given to us in Acts chapter 1, verses 4. Jesus said, He ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but he, to wait for the promise of the Father. And He said to them, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. That was verse 5. And then in verse 8, he further goes on about this baptism of the Holy Spirit. And he says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So there are two things that he identified in that verse 8 that were going to happen when the Holy Spirit came on them. They were going to, one, receive power, and they were, two, they were going to be his witnesses. You know, the whole idea of giving a gift, a person has to receive a gift. And really, that's what God offers to us with the Holy Spirit. He doesn't force anything onto us. Just like himself, he doesn't force himself onto us. We have to choose to receive him, and we have to choose to receive the Holy Spirit. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And, and I think it empowers us to be who he has created us to be. It also, when, when we receive the Holy Spirit, it really empowers us to be his witnesses that he's created us to be here on earth. In the whole book of Acts, the whole giving of the Holy Spirit and the activity of the Holy Spirit is a pretty big aspect. And in, in, in the early church. And we're going to look at that. And there's kind of five main occurrences when it happens in the book of Acts. So we're going to look through each one of these experiences that happen in the book of Acts. And I, if, if you're taking notes, you could have four columns. And the, the first column would be the, occur, the, the occurrence, when it happened. And I'll give you the reference and the situation it happened in. The second column would be the timing. When did it happen in the believer's life? Was it when they first became a Christian or whether it was later on, after they were baptized, before they were baptized? We'll look at those. And then the third occurrence is, what was the evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit? How did they know that someone was really baptized in the Holy Spirit? And then the fourth column would be the effect. What was the effect that the being baptized in the Holy Spirit had on them? And what happened as a result of the Holy Spirit there? My, take away, the hope, my hope is that the, 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 the takeaway today will be that if, if we see that this happened back in the book of Acts, you, we can ask, each one of us can ask ourselves, is that happening in my life today? Am I... Am, Am I partaking of the power that God has made available to us today? And my hope, of course, is that, is that we do that. Because Jesus, when he taught the Lord's Prayer, he says, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And part of that Holy Spirit activity in our life is his kingdom ruling and reigning in our hearts and lives. So let's look at these five different occurrences in the book of Acts. The first one is in Acts chapter 2. And this happens on what's called the day of Pentecost. Now, Pentecost... Penta is five, or it was, it was 50, it was, an, it, was a, it was a holiday, and actually the word holiday comes from holy day, and so it was this holy day that happened 50 days after Passover, and so actually today is Pentecost, and, um, and so this is where, it's Pentecost Sunday, and so this, this event that they were experiencing, in Acts chapter 2 verse 1 says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Oh, let me back up. What Pentecost was, it was actually the celebration of the first fruits of wheat harvest as they gave it to God. They offered it to God. In the Old Testament, the Jewish tradition was that Pentecost commemorated the day that the law was first given to Israel. So it was the day when he first gave them the law. And what we're going to experience is that Pentecost in the New Testament is when the Holy Spirit first came on the believers and was first made available to the believers. So it's really an important day in our lives when we, when we embrace it. Uh, you know, you've heard the name probably Pentecostals. And where Pentecostals get their name from is they would be believers in Jesus that embrace this act that happened on the day of Pentecost as active for today. So there are some Christians that say, oh, it happened back there, and it's not for today. And uh, But then there's Pentecostals who believe that, that it happened back there, and it's still available for today. And if you didn't know, we are a Pentecostal church. And we believe that these events that happened back there are still available today. We don't cram it down people's throat, but we but it's it's an experience that empowers us to live and to be who God really made us to be. Uh, and 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 even though that's what we believe as church, not every person I realize that not every person in church believes that. And my hope is this is that each one of us will be able to go from where we're at and we can grow closer to Jesus. And that each one of us will take a step. And so if you're someone that you say, you know what, I really have never embraced that, then maybe today you'd consider in a new way that, hey, maybe it's, maybe it's something that God has for me. Maybe it's something that in, in my growth in life that I can move a step closer to what Jesus has planned for me. So we read the first verse, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. There was about 120 of them. It says, I think in verse, chapter 1, verse 15, I think it is, it said there's 120 believers together. Um, so these were all believers. These were the disciples of Jesus. 
These people had already had Christ come into their life, and they were together there that day. And then we go on in verse 2, and we see, it says, Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So the occurrence, with day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, the timing, this was subsequent to salvation. These people were all believers when they received this. They were already had the Holy Spirit living in them. This is a second unveiling of the Holy Spirit in their lives. And then how did they see the evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, it says there was tongues of fire that came and, and were on each one of their heads. And then it says they spoke in tongues. They spoke in another language. And we're going to read more about that here. And, and actually, that's going to tell us what the effect was on them and the believers there. And so if we continue on in verse 5, it says, Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. This was a big festival, so people had come to Jerusalem, and there were people that were from all over the world that were there that lived in Jerusalem. It says, every nation under heaven. Verse 6, When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one of them heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? That was not a compliment, okay? These are simple Galileans. And yet, these people from all around the then known world said, hey, we hear them speaking in our language, our native language. How is it? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own languages, or in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, What does this mean? It goes on and says, Some, however, made fun of them and said, They have had too much wine. So, one of the things is you might ask is, Why tongues? And I have used this, this is what makes sense to me, is that when I want to talk with God, when I'm praying to God, every, and just like now when I'm talking to you, Everything I'm saying is going through my mind. My mind is a filter. And, and, and I could say it goes through my soul. My soul being my mind, will, and emotions. That I filter it all. When my spirit wants to talk directly with God's spirit, when I pray in my tongues, my, it bypasses my mind. And my spirit says what it wants to say to God. Now what they said here is that they were declaring the wonders of God in their own tongues. In, every, in all these native tongues. So they recognized some of them. I don't know if every person was speaking a, native, a language or if it was a heavenly language. But they heard them, these people that were there heard them praising the wonders of God. They are talking about the wonders of God. Um, you know, we want to experience the kingdom of heaven on earth as it is in heaven. And I think that one of the ways that God has opened up for us to do this is with this special prayer language of speaking in tongues. There's no inhibitions. There's no, our mind doesn't tarnish what we're saying. Our spirit can speak directly to God, uninhibited. And so then it goes on, and then and in verse 14 it says, Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. And it, he addresses the crowd, and he then he quotes, and he gives a whole message. But he quotes in that message, he quotes from the prophet Joel. And in Joel, in verse 17 it says, he, when he quotes from Joel, it says, In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. So, Peter knew these verses from Joel. He remembered these verses from Joel. And he goes, ah, this is what Joel was talking about. In the last days, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all people. We're seeing that happen today. And he says, tells him. He goes on and he quotes more from Joel. And he, bottom line, he says, all kinds of people are going to receive this. Now, I don't think Peter really fully understood when he says all kinds of people are going to experience this. Because we're going to see later on that Peter had a real hard time with some people receiving this. He did embrace it. But, but, but initially, he had a hard time. When he's speaking here... He thinks it's only for the Jewish people. And then in verse 21 it says, And everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. This is from Joel also. So there was this whole thing that everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. And it says that his spirit will come to all people. So it's available for all of us. So I think what a takeaway that we can take from this is that, you know, from back in verses uh, 12 and 13, some of the people when they heard this, they said, What does this mean? What does this mean for us? But then there were some people that said, these guys are drunk. They're crazy. And so I'd ask this, what is your response to this? When you hear about speaking in tongues, do you say, what does this mean for me? Or do you say, no, that's a craziness? 
My hope is that today you can, you can go, you know what? If God had it for those people then, and he said that it was for all people, maybe it's something that he's made available for me too. Some people say that when they heard them, that, that actually these people were preaching and preaching, um, and that these people heard about Jesus in the message. But the reality is this, is that Peter had to preach a message after this. And the great result of that message that Peter preached afterwards, at the end of it, they said, what do we do? And he says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, be baptized and you'll be saved. And they baptized 3,000 people. 3,000 people were added to the church that day. And um, so the effect was pretty big. What was the effect that, that, that they saw? They were, it said that the, the people that heard, they were utterly amazed. And they heard these guys speaking the wonders of God. And they ultimately said, what does this mean for us? We realize it has some impact on our life. And 3,000 people were saved that day. So that's why we get the name. That, from that experience is what we get the name um, Pentecostals or in, in, in this day of Pentecost today, what we're celebrating. So the next one we're going to look at is in, in Acts chapter 8. And the occurrence is the church had been scattered and Philip went to Samaria. And we're going to read about the experience that he had in Samaria and what happened there. So Acts chapter 8 verse 4, it says, Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went, went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they were paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So Philip goes down there and he's preaching this message and he's praying for people, and people are being healed, and demons are coming out of people. There's all these supernatural signs that were happening in, as Peter's there, and the people were amazed. So the, and it continues on in verse 8, it says, So there was great joy in that city. And then jump down to verse 12, and it says, But when they believed, the people believed Philip, as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God, and the name of, Je and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. So these people heard the message, they believed, and then they were baptized in water. As we continue on, one of the people that we're, gonna, that we're kind of jumping over some verses about is a guy named Simon. Now Simon was a sorcerer, he made money from telling fortunes and stuff, but, or from doing a sorcery. And um, verse 14 says this, When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. So, so Philip had preached that first message. Now Peter and John come. When they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. So they had been baptized, they had they'd received Christ, they had been baptized in water. But when they came, they said, Hey, we can see the Holy Spirit hasn't fully come here yet. And my question is, what did they see? It doesn't specifically say, my argument would be that they did not, had not experienced speaking in tongues. So, they had, it says that they had simply been baptized and in the name of the Lord Jesus. Verse 17 says, Then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. So when they came there, they said, hey, the Holy Spirit's not been here. They placed their hands on him, pray for him, and then they say, hey, the Holy Spirit's come now. I think that it was probably because it was evidenced by them speaking in tongues. But I will admit the verses do not say that here. But something happened. Now, it goes on, this guy Simon, when Simon saw the Spirit was given on the laying on of apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me this, also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. So Simon saw something that these guys did, and he wanted it. And he was willing to pay money for it. Now Peter rebukes him, and we hope that Simon repented. We don't know what happened to Simon. But he says, hey, this is not something you can buy. You can't buy this thing. It's, it's a gift that God gives to us. So the timing, the, the occurrence here in Samaria was in, the, in, in chapter 8, the timing was that the people believed and were baptized in water, and then they received this baptism of the Holy Spirit. The evidence, that nothing, something happened that the people could see that they had it or they did not have it. And then the effect was Simon wanted that ability to lay his hands on the people so that they could receive. You know, what is the takeaway? The takeaway from here, I would hope, is that, you know, it's a gift and it's not an ability. It's not something we can buy. There needs to be the desire in our heart to receive it versus being compelled to take it. And it's something that God offers to us. He's not going to force anybody to take something that they don't want. And so my hope is that we as a body of believers want all that God has for us and that we will be willing to trust him. The third occurrence is in Acts chapter 9 and this is around Saul's conversion. Saul who later became, his chain name was changed to Paul and he wrote most of the New Testament and in verse chapter 9 verse 17 it says, then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Now what had happened is Saul had become a Christian the Holy Spirit 
had spoken to Ananias and said, go pray for this man, he's blinded, and pray for him that he'll receive his sight. And Ananias is like, I heard about him, he kills Christians, I don't want to go. But the Holy Spirit said, no, his heart's been changed. And so there in verse 17, Ananias went to the house, entered it, placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. So, the occurrence here was Saul had become a believer. Several days later, Ananias comes, prays for him. He can see again, and he is filled with the Holy Spirit. Then, they went and they baptized him in water. So, not always is it a person believes and is baptized in water, and then baptized in the Holy Spirit. Sometimes people are baptized, it's always that they believe first. They've already received Christ, and then they could be baptized in the Holy Spirit, and then baptized in water. Now, it doesn't, again, in this situation, it doesn't say specifically what happened. But I want to make this argument, is that, and I'm going to show you some verses. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, and 14, Paul addresses the proper use and the misuse of spiritual gifts. One of them being speaking in tongues. In chapter 12, Paul talks about the spiritual gifts. And, and he talks about how, and he makes an analogy to the body, to the physical body. And he talks about how there's the unity of the body. The body all functions as one, and there's diversity within the body. In the same way that we have different parts of our body, and yet our body all functions as one, in, the, in our community, Christian body, it's unity. There's one, we're all centered around Christ, and yet each one of us have different parts. And he's talking about these different gifts that people have. And then in chapter 13, we know it as the love chapter. You hear it often at weddings and things. Really, it's, it's that love is the foundation of the gifts. That if you have all these gifts that he's talking about, and you don't have love, you have chaos. And that's, he's addressing a problem in the Corinthian church where there was a lot of chaos going on. And he was talking about what is the proper use. And so it's really, it's, it's really about the proper spiritual gifts need to be founded in love. And when they're used. And then in chapter 14, he talks about the spiritual gifts. And, and really what he makes a distinction here is, is there's spiritual gifts in the private life and there's spiritual gifts in the public life. Public life being like in a church setting, in a community. And so some of the arguments he makes there is, is that in verse 2 he says, When we speak in tongues, we speak to God and not to men. So we're speaking directly to God and not to men. Now, the situation in that church in Corinth was they were using it as a show, showing, hey, I'm more spiritual than you are, because look, i got this heavenly language. I speak in this language of the angels. And they were using it as a show-off, and, and he's like, you guys missed it. It's got to be about love. And, and you need to consider, are you in a private setting or a public setting? Uh, it also says in that verse 2 that when we speak in tongues, we utter mysteries by the Spirit. So we're uttering mysteries that we don't know by the Spirit. Verse 4 says, when we speak in tongues, the person who speaks in tongues edifies themselves, not the church. So this is something to edify yourself. And he does make the distinction that if there is a, 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 a speaking, a public speaking in tongues, there needs to be an interpretation or it doesn't edify anyone. Then in verses 14 and 15 of chapter 14, he says, For if I pray in my tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. So what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my, I will also pray with my understanding. I will sing with my spirit, and I will sing with my understanding. So he's saying, hey, my spirit is edified, but my mind is not edified. My mind is unfruitful. And then a powerful verse he says in verses 18 and 19. He says, I thank God I speak in tongues more than all of you. In my private life, he's, he was thankful that he speaks in tongues more than anyone else because his spirit was edified. But then in verse 19 he says, but in the church... I would rather, rather speak five intelligible words than a thousand words, five, five intelligible words to instruct than 10,000 words in a tongue. So in a church setting, you're saying, hey, you need to have intelligence. People need to be, under, be able to understand what's going on. If we all came here this morning and all spoke in different languages, no one would get anything. We have to speak in something that's common. And that's why we use English in this situation. And, but he's saying, you know what, I'm glad that I speak in tongues more than all of you. My whole argument here is this, is that Paul embraced greatly the value of this gift of his private prayer life of speaking in tongues. And, um, and in that chapter 14, as I said, he talks about in the public setting versus the private setting. He's saying in the private setting, hey, I want it more than everything. And in the public setting, 
you need to you need to have understanding and you need and if there's a tongue then there needs to be interpretation so that people can be edified built up takeaway that i get from this story this occurrence is that speaking in tongues is a per personal thing it doesn't take crowds of people to do it it's a perfect gift to receive in this time of when everybody's in their stay-at-home order right in other words, it's something for you and your spirit if you're being if you're being weighed down i encourage you utilize this gift that god has given to you seek this gift god will make it available we'll read some verses later to talk about that it's not really an event you know today is the day of pentecost and there's a lot of people that are all excited about we need to do special things on the day of pentecost i say man we got to be careful about not lifting up days and things we need to only lift up jesus we need to elevate Jesus and who he is and not lift up days and, and, and worship the day. We worship the giver, the creator, the one that's given us this gift. Okay, now the fourth occurrence is in Acts chapter 10. And this is in a man whose name is Cornelius in his house. Now Cornelius, well let me just read the verses. Acts chapter 10 verse 1 says, At Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion, and who is known as the Italian regiment. So this guy was a Gentile Roman. Okay, he was not a Jew. And we're going to see how Peter and all the other apostles thought that, hey, all these gifts, Jesus was for the Jews. And this is going to break into a whole new territory. So, so Cornelius had, it says in three in the afternoon, he had a vision of a man named Simon coming to his house. And the spirit speaks to him and says, hey, Simon, send your ser or Cornelius, send your ser servants to Joppa. And there's a man there who is on the street. Uh, who uh, is that Simon the Tanner's house and um, his name is Peter and bring him here he lives down by the sea so he got directions of where to go so Cornelius sends two servants along to go get this guy and it says the next day about noon as they were getting close to the where Simon was at or Peter was at Peter has a vision now Peter was hungry for lunch so he goes lunch is being prepared for him he says I'm gonna go take a nap upstairs he goes and lays down and while he's laying down he has a vision he has a vision of a big sheet being let down to him from heaven. And on that sheet are all kinds of unclean animals. Animals that he as a Jewish person would never touch because they were considered unclean in the Old Testament. And a voice says to him, Peter, get up, kill, and eat. And he goes, no, 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 no. I would never touch an unclean animal like that. And the voice says, what God has made is clean. Don't call it unclean. This happens three times to him. And in those three times, he finally realizes, okay, what God makes is not is, is clean. All of a sudden, there's a knock on the door, and he goes down, gets the door, and these guys say, hey, we were we were told to come get you. You're supposed to come. And, and, and actually, the Holy Spirit, it says, the Spirit said to him in verse 19, it says, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you. So get up, go downstairs, do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. So Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? And so they tell him, hey, our master Cornelius called for you. He had a vision of you coming to our house. So Peter gets his stuff together and they travel to Cornelius' house. When he gets to Cornelius' house, in verse 27, it says, Acts 10, 27, it says, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, you are well aware that this is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. Then Peter speaks a message to these people. And, um, and he says, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. And while he was preaching his message, in verse 44, it says, While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. And there were some Jewish men that had come along with him. And those men, when they were astonished, when they saw the gift of the Holy Spirit, had been poured out even on the Gentiles. So these Jews were like blown away. that They saw the Holy Spirit come on these Gentiles. How did they see it? They heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. So that was the evidence to them that these men were been baptized in the Holy Spirit, is that they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, Can anyone keep these people from being baptized with water? They have received the Holy Spirit, just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. So, this occurrence at Cornelius' house, first they were believers. Peter preaches to them. They get baptized in the Holy Spirit and are speaking in tongues. And then Peter says, Hey, these guys have been baptized in the Holy Spirit. What keeps them from being baptized in water? So then they got baptized in water. 
the evidence was that they spoke in tongues, they were speaking in tongues and praising God. And the, the effect really was this, that it forced the Jews to embrace the Gentiles. It broke up prejudices that they had against the Gentile believers, people that were, and that's us. We can be thankful for this. Now, this is in Acts chapter 10. It didn't stop there because Peter goes back to Jerusalem and in Acts 11, it's about his encounter with the other believers. They go, what are you doing, Peter? You can't go to Gentiles. And he says, hey, listen, guys, uh, let me read the verse for you. He says in verse 11, of or, or sorry, verse 17 of chapter 11, he says, so if God gave them the same gift as he gave us, who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could oppose God? This, this argument isn't settled there, and it gets into a situation where they actually have a council get together to, to discuss this, and that's in Acts chapter 15. And at that council, where all these religious guys got together, Peter stands up, and he addresses them. And in verse 8, he says, God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He's referring back to that day of Pentecost. So, to Peter, speaking in tongues was proof that God accepted the Gentile believers and that God had given them the Holy Spirit. So, what is the takeaway from this? I think one thing that we can take away is that God really woke up Peter to accepting all his children. Now, we embrace that. I don't think that we really struggle with that God doesn't accept all different races of people or all different groups of people. We believe that he accepts that. But, one of the challenges is that in the Christian community, there are people that go, well, God doesn't use this gift anymore. And really, I think that's really kind of being like Peter, saying, hey, that's not good. I think that this gift is available to every one of us. There's no place that we see in the Bible where it says, hey, this is just for this little select group of people. This is for everyone. So let us assume that speaking in tongues is not for today, or it's not that it's, it's for today, because there are people that say it's not for today or if it's not for me. This is a gift that Jesus said is for every person that chooses to receive it. And my encouragement is my hope that every one of us can embrace it today. Okay, our last one that we're going to look at is in Acts chapter 19. And this is with the Ephesian believers. And this is one that Paul is involved with. And Acts chapter 19 verse 1 says, While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples. So these were believers already. And he asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, No, we didn't even know that there was a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked them, what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Paul placed his hands on them, and the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. So this occurrence in Acts chapter 19, verses 1-7 through 7, with Ephesian believers, the timing is, they had already become believers. They had had John's baptism, but they had not received baptism in the name of Jesus. So he baptizes them, and then they receive this gift. Uh, how was it evidenced? It was evidenced by them speaking in tongues and prophesying, it says in verse 6. So we've looked at these five instances, and we've looked at the timing of it, that it happened. It wasn't something that happened when they first became a Christian, became a follower of Jesus. It was something that happened subsequent to that. Sometimes before water baptism, sometimes after water baptism. The common evidence that I believe was really being filled with the Holy Spirit was this gift of speaking in tongues. And the effect was power and the witness in people's lives. You know, to be the church, as we talked about in the beginning, to be the church, that expression of the kingdom of heaven on earth, we need more than we have in ourselves. I need more than I have. In myself, I can be really selfish. In myself, I can think of my own thoughts and needs. In myself, I'm only running on the strength that I have. I need more than that. I need all that God has for me. And I think that this gift is one of those attributes that God has given to us so that we can do what he has called us to do, that we can be who he's called us to be. So there's different responses that you may have today. First, I have four different kinds of categories of people in their responses. First category is this. You may be a person that has received this in the past and is using it and is active. And I just, you, you believe it and already practice this. I say continue to utilize that power. Don't forget the power that you have. The power that's been made available to us. And it's a choice. As a, as a person who has received that gift when I was a, in junior high, it's something that I have to choose to practice. I can, I can neglect it. And I have to choose to practice it. I have to choose to utilize it. 
There's a second group of people that I'd say that you say, hey, I want to receive that. You're open to it. You believe it and you want to embrace it. If it if it's available, you know, if it's available, I want it and I need it. You understand that. And let me refer you to Luke chapter 11, verses 9 through 13. When Jesus said, Jesus is speaking, he says, So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. And then verse 11. Which of your fathers, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? God wants to give the Holy Spirit to everyone who will receive it. This gift of empowerment in our life. This gift of speaking in tongues. So, you know, today we're going to have worship in just a minute. My time, my encouragement would be this, to say, God, I want this gift. And to anticipate it, to be ready for it. You may have, as you're singing or as you're in prayer in your own life, you may have some words come to your mind and you'll probably think that, oh, that's me making it up. I say, trust it, that it's God's gift for you, that he's empowering your spirit. Utilize that. And it's kind of like a, um, like a language. You know, you don't start off with a full fluidity of, of speaking all kinds of things. You start off with one word. And then you grow into two and three. And so, so utilize that. Embrace that. Step out in faith and embrace it. The third group of people that I'd be, I think we have in our, our group today would be those that are leery. You're, see, you're either leery because you've been taught against it a lot in Christianity. Or maybe it's a brand new idea. Maybe you've never heard of it. And, you, and, and so I say, say, my encouragement would be for you to say, God, I want your best for my life. And say, God, I want to take the next step. I want to believe. Help me to believe. Seek his best for your life. And then the fourth group of people is, this is kind of a joke, but it's, you can maybe saying, what just, what did you just talk about? If that's you, keep praying, keep coming, keep saying, God, help me to want your best for my life. We're going to go into worship, and then I'm going to come back, and I'll close this in prayer. But I say, you know what? Let's be a church that seeks the Holy Spirit active in our lives today.
Welcome here, come fly. 
thank you guys for leading us in those songs about the Holy Spirit. Trust you had a great worshipful experience there. I want to close the service now, and, and in closing, I just want to remind you, I, I identified several groups of people that may be here today listening to this message. Maybe you're one of those that have received and are utilizing this gift or using this gift of speaking in tongues. I encourage you, continue to use the power that God has made available to us. Sometimes we forget what God's made available to us and realize that, you know, this is a real power that is available for us. We need more than what we have in ourselves if we're really going to be who God made us to be in this world. This world needs Jesus. The second group of people is those that want to receive. You're the, that says, hey, if it's available, I want it. And, and, and I, I encourage you, continue to reach out. Continue to desire. If you want to pray, I would be more than happy to pray with you. Feel free to reach out to me or to others that are in our church. Because we want to see the Holy Spirit active and living in our church. And then there's that third group of people that are maybe leery because you've heard teaching against it or that it's not for today. Or maybe it's a brand new idea. You've never understood it before, never knew what it meant before. Then I encourage you, maybe one thing to do is to read some books. There's some great books that are out there. One of the books, there's a couple books that we really encourage. One of them is called, it was written in the 1960s, early 1960s, and it's by a Episcopal priest named Dennis Bennett. And it's called Nine O'Clock in the Morning. And it's his story about how he, as an Episcopal priest, received this gift. And when he received it, then the higher-ups in, in that organization um, had they got him out of that church because they didn't embrace it, and they and they sent him up to Ballard, Washington, to a little tiny Episcopal church there. I thought they'd put it, snuff him out, but actually he really developed a big ministry and has had a big impact on people that have that that, that have pursued spiritual gifts. And so that's a great book. Another great book is one that I've really enjoyed. It's called The Beauty of Spiritual Language, written by Jack Hayford, who's a pastor of a Foursquare Church in California, and um, it's about unveiling the mystery of spiritual of speaking in tongues. And uh, that's a great book that just describes how God makes it available to us and what it is for us. And so there's so much more to talk about than I could cover today. You know, I encourage you, let's continue to seek it because God has way more than we know. And he wants to, to open up our doors. Let me pray with us as we go from here today. Jesus, thank you so much for the gift that you sent back to us that empowers us to be who you made us to be. Help us to be receptive, Father to your Holy Spirit. Help us to be receptive to what you're doing in our lives. Help us to re embrace the power, the comfort, the peace that's available to us through the Holy Spirit. As we go from here, God, help us to see what you're doing in our lives and in the lives of our church community, Father, and those around us, God. Thank you so much that we have you to lean on, you to find our strength from, God. Go with us today now. In your holy name, amen. Look forward to seeing you in live live next week. And God bless you as you as you go from here.